Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure you guys would rather, you know, be chilling on the couch and watching Netflix than, like, uh, you know, being here. Uh, so thank you very much for your attendance. I hope this talk will be slightly inspiring and hopefully insightful on how you can also, you know, start a business. Uh, so a bit about me before uh, I launch into the key lessons that I learned throughout my journey. Um, I actually graduated from this university, New York University, just two years ago. So uh, good to see some familiar faces. Um, and I'm in love with entrepreneurship. I actually believe that entrepreneurship is the answer to all of our needs. No need to rely on government, on public assistance. If there is a problem that bothers you, you can solve it and you cre can create a business around it. That's my motto. The other thing is, um, I published my first book in my second year of university. Uh, it's a Spanish book called Pangea. Then, in my final year I, uh, of university, I actually published a second book called uh, The Art of the Grind, which was a bestseller for two years across three categories in Amazon. So I'd highly you know, recommend you read it. It's actually for free on the Kindle store. Uh, and I'd highly recommend, uh, you know, like I would like to see your reviews of it. And uh, finally, I had two proudest moments of my life over the past two years. The first one was being featured in the cover of Forbes Middle East magazine. You know, it's quite something for a 23-year-old. And the second thing was, uh, you know, calling Donald Trump a bigot on CNN. So, you know a bit about my political views as well now. Um, and uh, the purpose of this talk is not really, I'm not, business is not a science. I'm not here to teach you, you know, some tricks or some, you know, workarounds to launching a successful business. What I'm aiming for is to inspire you and to show you that, like, through my journey and through personal anecdotes, you can incorporate them as well in order to get out from this session and feel just a little bit more, you know, capable to launching your own startup and being confident they can succeed. Right? So it's motivational more than it is you know, educational at the end of the day. And the first lesson I wanted to share with you, which is something I realized just four years ago. It might seem you know, self-evident, but let me ask you a question. Do you guys know most of these people on these pictures? Awesome, you can name them probably one by one. Now, when I ask fellow friends and people, do you think you can be as successful as Bill Gates, as innovative as Steve Jobs? as talented as Mark Zuckerberg? And the answer is always the same. Of course not. These are visionaries of our time. These are idols. These are almost like godlike figures. And then I just want to ask them, why? They have a brain just the size of yours, you know, 24 hours in the same day as yours. You know, they didn't come up with superpowers. They didn't come up from an alien galaxy. They're just humans. So there's nothing intrinsic about them that makes them different or superior than any single one of us. So why do we feel that we can't achieve as much? And the moment you realize that they're no different, no better, no more skilled, then you actually start coming to the realization that, yes, I can too. In fact, that first uh, time I realized this was uh, when, uh, in my first year of university, when I met Bill Clinton and Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, during the Clinton Global Initiative. And we were sharing pizza at that time with Jack Dorsey. And when you were looking at these people who you just see on TV and like in newspapers and magazines, and you see them, you know, having fun time, you know, also having to go to the toilet for a pee, you know, like they're having the same concerns, the same worries, not having slept as much. And you start seeing that human aspect of it. Not like the, the godlike figure that is market to us, but the human behind it. And it's just like that humbling experience is also an empowering, empowering one. Because I realized that day that I can be you know, as successful as the founder of Twitter. No questions asked. And that's what I'm on a journey to you know, achieve. The second thing, which is um, something I always advise uh, university students on, get out. You could be you know, working like, in a job that like, takes you to the office from 8 to 5. You could be attending classes in university from like, 8 to 5. But don't make the mistake of slipping in a routine where you just do what you're tasked to do during the day, and then you're so tired that by the time you come back home, you just crash on the couch and look forward to the weekend. Opportunities do not happen in a routine mode or lifestyle. You have to go to the places, to the events, to the, to the, you know, like the settings where innovation is shared and opportunities are shared. In fact, I'll give you an anecdote from my own personal life. Just uh, two years ago, I was attending this event called Mix and Matcher by an ecosystem player called Wamda. So what they do is they bring you know, influential entrepreneurs and tech uh, you know, like, uh, uh, businessmen and moguls in Dubai. And in that meeting, I met Magnus Olsen. Now, Magnus Olsen, for those who don't know him, is the founder of Kareem, right now the largest tech company in the Middle East. And because of the fact that I met him at that event and spoke to him for five minutes and got his email, Today, Kareem is our biggest client. Because I was in the same spot where he was, just you know, giving him a need that he was looking for, which was cybersecurity. So if I wasn't attending that event, and by the way, skipping classes, 
I would not have been able to land my biggest client. So this is not a very popular advice you know, with teachers and educational professionals. You know, when I tell students to you know, skip classes and go to events where you acquire real life skills, but that's the reality we all have to face and we have to accept. If anything, educational you know, institutions and universities need to adapt to that fact of merging or at least incorporating the corporate world, you know, making you street smart as much as they're making you book smart, because that makes a difference. This one is also one of my favorites, which is the need to work smart, not hard. And again, I'm going to give you a personal anecdote. Six years ago, when I went to my last, into my last year, two years of high school, my only mean of leaving Morocco at that time, because we're not well off, was you know, to go to conferences or get scholarships to attend certain special programs you know, outside of Morocco. Now, it's a very tedious process, you know, going on the internet, looking for you know, scholarships, finding requirements. Some of them were relevant to me as a Moroccan, some were not. So that process of looking for these opportunities every day was time consuming, inefficient, and I thought maybe there is a better way to do this. What's the laziest way I can go for that will bring these opportunities to me rather than me searching for them? The answer was simple. I just created a Facebook group, called it Opportunities for Students, invited my high school friends, we started with like 30, and I asked them, let's create a platform where we share opportunities with each other. Could be, you know, essay contests, could be, you know, university scholarships, it could be summer programs, and let's just post them. Maybe someone will benefit. Five years down the line, today my group has over 65,000 international students on it, actively engaging and supporting each other with over 20 to 30 opportunities posted per day. Now, I go around the world into conferences, and I just ask a show of hands sometimes to these young students, and I tell them, how did you hear about this conference? And I can bet you that at least five or six people will raise their hand and they said, we saw it on a group called Opportunities for Students. Most of them they don't even know that I'm the founder. So it's always you know, good to see that like, a, an action that started because I was lazy, because I tried to find a shortcut, actually led to something that's useful. So always find a way to do so. And in fact, like Bill Gates really stresses this on when he uh, mentioned in his famous quote, I choose a lazy person to do a hard job because a lazy person will always find an easy way to do it. So be that lazy person who works smart, not hard. And it's something we need to teach our young students as well in universities, in high schools. Because we think that you know, like the more hours we spend on homeworks and digesting books is the way to move forward. While there are you know, plenty of information that sometimes is obsolete, sometimes is not relevant, there is not customized education. So you could be spending just like half an hour of your day learning the material that is relevant to you as opposed to spending eight hours per day doing something that you'll forget the same second you finish that exam. So incorporate this as a mean of life. Don't see it as a negative way because a lot of people think that laziness is a negative you know, character trend. For me, it's a great skill to have. The next thing I usually advise people if you want to have like, you know, great business is to start with the first step, which is being visible. If you don't exist online, you don't exist at all. If I Google your name and there's nothing that shows up on the internet, then you have no claim to start a business because that's the first place people will look for you. They're not going to knock on doors looking for iTunes or for Ahmed. They're going to actually Google his name and see what skills does this guy have, what kind of opportunities is this guy leading, what kind of business is this guy starting. And that's the first thing I did. I wanted to be known as an authority, as an industry expert in my field. Because once you're known as an expert, people come to you with opportunities. Now, would you say that you'd love the opportunity to meet Elon Musk and pitch him your next big idea? Would that be a fair claim to make? It would be. Why? Because Elon Musk has already established his place as a visionary, as a business luminary. So everyone is coming to him to make use of his expertise and skills to create like great startups. All he can do right now literally is to just like, you know, sit down in his like office, do nothing all day and just p ask people to come in, pitch him his ideas, take a cut and like be, you know, live happily ever after. So this is what you're trying to aim for. Always reverse the trend. Don't be the one running after people. Try to make people run after you. And the best way to do that is to be visible online, to create content around yourself and around the topics you want to be an expert in. So for me, I started writing blog posts about entrepreneurship, about technology, about like how to start like a startup, about, you know, at that time, cybersecurity. Started with something simple on LinkedIn. Doesn't, it's free, doesn't take much of your time. You could literally read two articles on cybersecurity and post an article the next day. And when people Google cybersecurity, your article will pop up. Now they'll say, interesting, 
this guy might be an expert in this field because the first article I get on the industry or on the topic is this guy's LinkedIn post. And that's how people start reaching out to you. Next thing, take it to the next level. Become like a contribution author or a blog post in other well-known, you know, like publications. At that time, I was writing for something called Elite Daily, which is a millennial publication. I just like volunteered to write articles for free for them. No one says no to free content. In exchange, I was building more and more online content around it or like around myself. And that also built a greater online brand for the person that I was. And finally, you know, I got to the next level, which is, hell, why am I writing for some other people? Why cannot, can I not create my own publication? I'm writing this content already. I might just as well host it on my own platform. And that's how I launched my online publication called Golf Elite, which is a million, uh, millennial publication, you know, focusing on technology, startups, you know, lifestyle. And in literally one year, we were hitting 40,000 readers a month. Now, people were actually coming to me, asking me to host their content on my platform. Now you're controlling the narrative. Now you can self-promote yourself because it's my publication. I can write an article tomorrow about me and about my business and about my products. Create online content around yourself and around the topics you want to be known for. Next thing I did, which was again like coming back to the lazy part, all the articles I wrote over those two years for those, you know, like guest blogs for my, uh, for my own publication, I just literally collated them, got them together and put them in a book. Picked my best like 30 articles, wrote a book that's 30 chapters. The next thing you know, I put it for free, published it by myself. You don't have to hire, you know, like a, a publication agency to do that. You can just like put it on a PDF, put it on Amazon's Kindle store. You got yourself a new audience. You're now an author. Congratulations. My book now is like so best selling like and most downloaded across startups, motivation and business category on the Kindle store for two years now. And people used as reference to reach out to me. And finally, once you build enough, you know, online content, online, you know, like personal brand, then everyone starts running after you. TV stations will start calling you. Magazines will start calling you. Publications will start featuring you. Now you create a demand for yourself as opposed to running after others. Now you can see there's a trend here. Don't be the guy wasting time or resources trying to go after people or opportunities. Find a way to reverse the trend. Now, the other thing I speak to students about, and not students as well, is how to get that initial start in business. Now, I have a great idea, I have a great like, app I'd like to publish. How do I go about it? And the problem we have today, and it's a big problem due to the school system we went to, is that we're wired for perfection. If you get a wrong answer in a test, you get chastised, you get like a negative you know, like mark. If you mess something at home, your parents are on you, you know, like telling you what the hell you're doing. We're always getting criticized for failing. When in fact, we should be encouraged to fail, fail fast, and learn from our failures to, do, to be better. And that's the exact thing in business. The first application or the first product you put out there is not perfect. It just needs to be working. The minimum feature is needed to prove your point. And that's what I usually do. I don't spend too much time or resources on launching a business. I spend the minimum required you know, amount of time and resources to put something to the public and then let the public the best judge. They'll give you feedback. They'll use your application and tell you, oh, I think this can be done better. Actually, I don't like this button here. I think this feature could be incorporated. Now you don't even have to have an R&D team. The users become your R&D, your source of development, and you start iterating. Next month, you incorporate their feedback, put version 2.0, and that's it. The journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. And the problem is most people look at that journey as a 200 kilometer, uh, you know, like 200 kilometer journey, while in fact, all they have to look for is just in front of them. I just need to take that first step. It takes maybe three months, it takes maybe six months or one year, but you'll ultimately make it. People are celebrated in public for what they have spent 10 years practicing in private. We like to talk about you know, overnight successes, Alibaba, Facebook, Google. But what we don't know is that these guys were literally hustling for 10 years before their companies become such a worldwide success. That's why most of these like, entrepreneurs, they like to say, we are an overnight success 10 years in the making. So don't look at the big picture. Look at the first step. Now this 
can be either you know, like a great advice or really bad advice, but in business, never listen to friends. Because their advice, most of the time, is not helpful. Because that's what fr friends are for, you know? They're there to comfort you, to tell you you're great, to tell you you're nice, even where you're screwing up. They're not honest with you. Our friends in business are customers, because customers have a great you know, tendency for honesty. If they like your product, or they like your business or your service, they'll give you a contract, they'll give you dollars. If they don't like it, no deal. It's an easy process. It's a very honest process. And that's why when I start a business, the first thing I do is, if I get paid for a product or service, I know I have a win in business. If the customer is not willing to pay for it, then I have no business at all. So let the customer be the judge. You have an interesting application idea, create a prototype and take it to a customer and see if they're willing to put a dollar behind you know, their words. Because if you go to those customer feedback sessions and you tell people, what do you think of my app or my great idea that's going to be the next billion dollar, you know, like startup, they'll always tell you that sounds great. But then you ask them, can you give me $5 to buy it? Do you want to buy it for $5 or for $1? And they say, ah, I don't think so. I'll pass. And that's the thing. Always let customers be the best or the final judge. If they're willing to pay money for it, you have a business. If they're not, go back to the drawing board. Now, when I tell people that uh, you know, I'm the CEO of a cybersecurity company, and it doesn't get as technical as that, you know, cybersecurity is very advanced, they think that I have a CS background or I studied computer science and programming. Well, in fact, I studied finance and economics. I cannot code. Uh, for me, you know, like JavaScript or HTML sounds like Chinese. No offense to Chinese. <laughs> but the reason is you always can find someone to do the work or the tasks that you are not able to perform. If you have an idea and you need like, to create an application but you don't know how to code, simple. Find the person who can code and bring them on board. Because you cannot be everything. No one is Superman. You cannot be the lawyer and the CEO and the marketing guy and the developer and the finance and the account. No one can be everything at the same time. And we have to accept that and we have to be fine with that. Now, whenever you go to these seminars about business, everyone's telling you everyone should be able to program and to code. No, you don't need to do so. All the biggest startups are a combination of technical people and creative people. Find where you fit and be good at what you can do. If you're a creative guy, be good at being creative. Don't try to learn coding and to learn finance and try to do everything at the same time, because most of the time, you will fail if you try to do everything. And that's what put me pretty much to be the founder of Vonline, is because I found an amazing guy who was technical, he was a hacker, and I saw a business opportunity, and I told him, let's start a business. And today, we have a $15 million company in our hand. We're even featured on the cover of Force Middle East, you know, the ethical hackers over there, when in fact, I'm not an ethical hacker at all. But people would like to believe that because it's comforting to know that, you know, if he succeeded at this business in technical business, he must be a technical person. And that's not true. And that's not needed. So don't be discouraged by those people who tell you you have to be a programmer to have your own application and your own business. Show them plenty of examples in the world where founders of technical companies are not technical at all. And the other thing is, when you hear about like my story, it was not all you know like butterflies and you know like roses and like it's, it's an up, up and down journey. And in fact, I have like a business I like to mention usually called Alpaca. So I met this friend of mine, and he said, "Listen, I have a great network of women in Peru who do these like handmade you know like llama-based wood products. They're selling them in the city at like very small you know cheap prices. Do you think it would be great to put their products online?" create a larger user base for them, brand ourselves as a social enterprise, and make a killing by selling at premium price to outside markets. And I said, that sounds like a great idea. Let's try it. Spent like two months building the website, the e-commerce platform. We hired photographers to take pictures of our products. We had like a marketing guy to build the entire branding. But then once we launched, our sales were close to none. You're depressed at that time. You feel like you wasted two months of your life. But look back at what you learned from that journey. For me, I have no business you know, like trying to sell alpaca-based wood products to international markets because I have no expertise in the topic. I have no background. I had even no interest. I was doing it just because I thought it would make money. And that's the kind of wrong 
of motivation. But when I actually tried to see what did I learn from the process, I learned how to set up an e-commerce platform. You know, I got exposed to you know, like the nitty-gritty of SEO and trying you know, to sell stuff online, which was a great experience for me. But that business was not the right one to go for. So it was okay to fail, learn a great deal, but once you fail, you got to move forward. What's next? Don't be held back by your failures, because failures are part of life. If you're not failing, you're not living. And the last thing I want to close with is success lies outside of your comfort zone. People get comfortable. Our biggest issue as human beings is whenever we find ourselves in a setting where we don't have to worry or stress too much, we like to maintain that status. I have a cushy job. I get my salary at the end of the month. I'm paying my mortgage. Great. That's what I want from life. That's the wrong kind of attitude. The bolder you are, the higher the reward. In fact, I'll just give you an example. Just last week, I was in Sudan. I spent 10 days there. Now, graduating just two years ago and launching a business in the UAE, the last place I thought of being in was Sudan. But because there was opportunity, because we had like great network there, I went. Plenty of challenges, plenty of risk, but we came back from that journey or from that trip with five large deals, with two banks, one telecommunication company, and two government agencies. Now, Sudan is our next strategic market. If I didn't take that step to go to an environment where I wasn't comfortable, I wouldn't have had this opportunity and I would have this great like, you know, business uh, advance. So always try to challenge yourself and take or do things that you're not comfortable with, but that might you know, make you just a little bit better and a little bit more successful. So thank you for you know, listening. I hope you can reach out whenever you want. And uh, all I can say is I hope everyone here will leave this session feeling just a bit more motivated that you also can have your own successful business in a couple of years down the line. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed.